If you have your Bible, please turn to Exodus chapter 7. Exodus chapter 7, we have been going through this book. Um, we are at a crucial moment here in the book of Exodus where we are going to begin looking at the plagues poured out on Egypt. And I'd like to begin our time just by reading from Exodus chapter 7, beginning with verse 16. Exodus 7, verse 16. Moses and Aaron are before Pharaoh, and the Lord tells them this in verse 16. And you shall say to him, the Lord, the God of the Hebrews, sent me to you, saying, Let my people go, that they may serve me in the wilderness. But so far you have not obeyed. Thus says the Lord, by this you shall know that I am the Lord. By this you shall know I am the Lord. Behold. With the staff that is in my hand, I will strike the water that is in the Nile, and it shall turn to blood. Let's go to God in prayer this morning. Lord, we come before you, and we confess that you are over all, above all. And Lord, you are powerful over all of creation. Powerful over every created thing on this earth. Powerful over the weather. Powerful over the sky. And Lord, you are powerful over us. God, I pray that as we look at your mighty power today, that we would place ourselves under your authority. That we would submit to you. That we would serve you. And Lord, as we do this, we would find the love and forgiveness and mercy that can only be found in Christ Jesus. Lord, I pray that you would help us today. In Jesus' name, amen. We are looking at the plagues, and it got me thinking as I was preparing uh, about the year 2020. Everybody remembers the year 2020, right? It was the year of the global pandemic. It was the year of lockdowns. If you would have been told by people what was going to happen 20 years prior, you probably wouldn't have remembered. I mean, Kanye West came out with an album entitled Jesus is King. It was a pretty crazy year with the pandemic and the lockdowns, and it stands large in our society. We all remember that year very well. And I think as we look at the plagues on Egypt, we are tempted to just think that they are a Bible story that we heard growing up. But if you were to ask the Egyptians in that moment, they would all remember the year that the plagues came. The year that their entire water source, the Nile, was turned to blood. The year that they were infested with gnats and flies and frogs. The year that all their livestock died, the year that they all had boils all over their body, and the year that their firstborn sons perished. We are tempted to look at the plagues and see them as a Bible story. But the plagues are something that happened that loomed large in those people's lives, and it should loom large in our life today, because if the plagues are true, if what God did to the Egyptians is true, that means that he is powerful over everything. Over all of creation, over all of the created beings, he is over everything. And if we look at this text today and we see God's power and his might on display, we have to say, if this is the same God that we worship today, am I submitting myself under his authority in worshiping him, or am I placing myself in the path of his wrath and his judgment, just like the Egyptians? And I think that's the question we must answer today. I think many of us go through our life with everything going on in our life and the busyness of life, and we don't recognize that Jesus and God are supreme over everything. And we don't place ourselves under their authority and their rule and when we do that, we find ourselves in front of his wrath and his judgment. And today, I want to beg with you, to plead with you, to submit to Christ. 
to put yourself under his leadership, under his reign, because if God is over everything, then we should submit ourselves to him. So we are going to look at the plagues, and first we are going to see that God demonstrates his power through the plagues. God demonstrates his power through the plagues. When we come to the plagues, before we jump in, we, we kind of ask, what are they accomplishing? What is the end game? What is the result? Because ultimately, we know that Pharaoh let him go, but it was after the final plague, right? Right? After his firstborn son is killed, that's finally when he allowed them to go. And you might read the plagues and you might think, well, God, why didn't you just cut to the chase? Why did we have to go through this whole ordeal? Why did we have to do all those things? Couldn't you have just made it happen? But as we are going to see this week and next week as we look at the plagues, the point is God's power and his judgment on this. And it's not just that he is powerful, but that he is judging sinful humanity. The Egyptians and Pharaoh enslaved God's people. They were essentially shaking their fists at God and rebelling against him. And God comes in and he says there will be judgment for sin. If you remember a couple of weeks ago, we talked about the holiness of God. And we had Moses in the burning bush and what happened when he got near to the presence of God he had to take off his sandals he had to lay on the ground he had to hide his face because God is holy and in his presence he cannot have sin in his presence if sin comes in then it will be destroyed and dealt with and here we see God's judgment and his wrath but I'm afraid as a culture, as a people, we don't like talking about God's judgment and his wrath. We like talking about his mercy, about his forgiveness. We like hearing things that God loves you and has a wonderful plan for your life. And I'm not saying those things are wrong. I, I do think those things. I think he is merciful and loving and we should preach those things. But here in the text today, we see that God judges sin. There's a survey done by the Barna Group that says, in our culture, almost six out of every ten adults, a 60% agree that identifying moral truth is up to each individual. They say that there's no moral absolutes that apply to everyone at all times. That's 60% of the people in America would think this. That would mean you get to do what you want to do, and I get to do what I want to do, and you can believe what you want, and we can't really judge one another. We can't do that. But what God is saying here is that I'm over everything. Amen. I'm over the world. And you don't get to choose what's right and wrong. I have declared what is right and wrong. Amen. And you can either submit to the king and serve and follow him, or you can be in the path of destruction and judgment. We don't like talking about judgment but two things real quickly, if God doesn't judge sin, if God isn't a wrathful God on sin, then two things are true. If he doesn't judge sin, then first, God is not gracious. We like to talk about his grace and his mercy, but think with me, if you will, me and you are in a boat. We go out into the ocean. The waves start coming. The storm comes. There is rain pouring, and you get thrown out of the boat. You are drowning in the storm in the middle of the ocean, and I stand holding a life preserver, and I can throw it out to you. It would be gracious of me. It would be kind of me to do that in that moment, wouldn't it? Amen. And you would grab it, and we would pull you in, and you would say, thank you for saving me. But imagine, if you will, that is a nice, warm day. And you are at the pool, and you are in the shallow end of the pool just relaxing. And I come up, and I'm holding a life preserver. And I say, I'm here to save you. That's essentially what we're saying to God when we say we don't want his judgment and his wrath. We say, there's really no need for you to save me. There's no need for you to be gracious or kind because I'm fine. So if we fail to talk about his judgment, and his wrath, then he's not really gracious and merciful. There's nothing to be saved from. Secondly, if God doesn't judge sin, then God isn't good and holy. And therefore, we shouldn't worship him. 
If he doesn't execute judgment on sin, then why would we worship him? Imagine a courtroom, and you have a judge, and he's sitting there presiding over these cases. And all of these evil people who have committed evil and heinous acts come in day after day, and the judge says, no big deal. You can just go on your way. Just go back into society. We would say that's not a good judge. In the same way, if God just permits sin and never addresses it and never pours out his wrath and judgment, then he's not a good judge. But the fact that the plagues are here show us that he is worthy to be worshipped because he is holy, he is above all. And while the plagues demonstrate his judgment, they also demonstrate his mercy. Because he is saving a people, Israel. They are his people. And he has committed himself to them. And from the nation of Israel would eventually come the Messiah, Jesus Christ, who would bring salvation to all of the earth. And so while it is God's judgment and wrath being poured out, we also see that he's a God of great mercy and love to provide salvation in Christ. And so this is why we have the, power, the plagues to show his power. And he shows his power before the first plague. In verses 9 through 13, we see uh, God tell Moses, he says, Say to Aaron, take your staff, and I want you to throw it on the ground. And your staff is going to become a serpent. And his becomes a serpent, and it grows up. And then the other magicians who were in Pharaoh's court come, and they throw down their staffs. And they become snakes as well. But then in the passage we see that verse 11 or verse 12, each man cast down his staff and they became serpents. But Aaron's staff swallowed up theirs. At the beginning of this exchange in Exodus chapter 7 verse 9, God tells them to go and talk to Pharaoh. And he says, when Pharaoh says to you, prove yourselves by working a miracle, they are to do this. What essentially Pharaoh is saying is, I don't know your God, I don't believe in your God, I don't trust your God, and I'm going to keep doing things my way. And God is essentially saying, before the plates come in, he says, are you sure you want to go down this path, Pharaoh? He shows the staff turning into a serpent, and it begins to eat and consume all the other magician staff. And he's essentially saying, I have power over everything. I have power over you, over your magicians, over your land, over your people. And are you sure you want to go down this path? In verse 13, chapter 7, still Pharaoh's heart was hardened. And he would not listen to them as the Lord had said. Next week, we're going to look at Pharaoh's hard heart. But today, we see that God's power is on display through the plagues. Next, we see God demonstrates his power over the world's gods. God demonstrates his power over the world's gods. We have two plagues that happen back to back. The first plague, God tells Moses and Aaron to go out and command him to let you go. And when he doesn't let you go, you are to put your staff in the water and it will turn to blood. Look at verse 20 of Exodus chapter 7. Moses and Aaron did just as the Lord commanded in the sight of Pharaoh and in the sight of his servants. He lifted up the staff, he struck the water in the Nile, and all the water in the Nile turned to blood. Verse 21. And the fish in the Nile died, and the Nile stank, so the Egyptians could not drink water from the Nile. But there was blood throughout the land of Egypt. Check. There we go. So we see that there is a plague happening. We see that God demonstrates his power over the Nile. But then look at verse 22. But the magicians of Egypt did the same by their secret arts. So again, we have the magicians come in. And again, the magicians say, we can do the same thing that you can do. And then we have the second plague, which is frogs. And it says this in verse 3, God tells them to let him go. And in verse 3 of chapter 8, 
It says the Nile shall swarm with frogs that shall come up into your house and into your bedroom and on your bed and into the houses of your servants. Verse 4, the frogs shall come up on you and your people and your servants. How would you like that, to have frogs all over your house? Wake up in the morning, there's a frog in your bed. Wake up in the morning, you go to get a cup of coffee and you're just stepping on frogs. Open up the cabinet, they're jumping out on you. That would be awful, but that is what God has put here in the plagues. But look at verse 7. But the magicians did the same by their secret arts and made frogs come up out of the land of Egypt. And so now you have two plagues, and what they are getting at, what God is proving through these plagues, is that God is powerful over the gods of the Egyptians. The Egyptians had about 80 gods that they worshipped. They had about 80 gods, and they all were part of about three different areas of life. They centered around the Nile, the land of Egypt, and the sky. And as we go through the plagues, we are going to see that God shows his authority and his power over each of these things. And the first two are an attack on the Nile. The people of Egypt worship the Nile River. And yet God comes in and he says, I will turn it to blood. I will make it so you cannot have fresh water. You will have to dig wells in order to drink. And God shows his power over these things. And we know that it is God doing this and not some natural event. Because look at, again, in verse 7, 17 of chapter 7. It says, thus says the Lord, by this You shall know I am the Lord. And if you noticed, the staff is in each of these first three events. He is putting the staff in, and that's what's causing this. God is saying, this is not some natural phenomenon, but I am causing this to happen. After the frogs have been in there, Pharaoh asks for relief. Moses prays to God that the frogs would come out. And look at verse 13 of chapter 8. Chapter 8, verse 13. And the Lord did according to the word of Moses. The frogs died out in the houses, the courtyards, and the fields, and they gathered them together in heaps, and the land stank. Man, stank would be a good word for that, right? It said they were in heaps. And can you imagine all of these frogs, these great mounds, in the desert sun, baking, smelling, and festering? This was not some natural phenomenon where they had this infestation of frogs. This was an act of God to bring them out. And God is showing them that he is over their gods that they worship. The gods that they think control everything, God says, Yahweh is over them. He's not just powerful, though, over the gods of Egypt. He's also powerful over these magicians. When we hear the word magician, we might think that this is Siegfried and Roy out here on the Nile Strip, you know, performing for all of these people. But in reality, in verse 11 of chapter 7, it says that they are wise men. They are sorcerers. They are magicians. They practice the arts, and they were in Pharaoh's camp. Pharaoh trusted them. He went to them for advice. They were highly regarded. And so they can perform these things, but you know what they cannot do? They can't reverse any of it. They can turn their snakes to a serpent, maybe sleight of hand, maybe they have a cobra hidden somewhere and they get it out, but they can't make it turn back into a staff. Moses can turn the water to blood, and on a small scale, they might could turn it to blood too, but you know what they can't do? Reverse it back to water that can give life. They can produce these frogs, but they can't make them go away. Eventually, Pharaoh recognizes this, and he goes to them. Chapter 8, verse 8. Look at chapter 8, verse 8. Then Pharaoh called Moses and Aaron, and he said, Plead with the Lord to take away the frogs from me and my people, and I will let the people go to sacrifice to the Lord. I feel with Pharaoh. That would be awful. Frogs everywhere, all the time. And he comes, and he's at his wit's end, and he says, Moses, he doesn't go to the magicians. He says, Moses, plead with your God to take them away. And I love Moses' response, verse 9. Moses said to Pharaoh, be pleased to command me when I am to plead for you and your servants, for your people, that the frogs 
would be cut off from you. Moses essentially says, you tell me when and I'll make it happen. Just waiting on you, Pharaoh. Right? You can see Moses say, God's in control. And if I were to ask him, he could do it quickly. And what does Pharaoh say? He says, tomorrow. Pharaoh recognizes. Hey, get them out of here. And Moses said, be it as you said. And he prays and God takes them away the next day. Pharaoh recognized the power of the magicians was some cheap imitation, some cheap trick. Katie and I, when we lived in seminary, uh, we lived in these townhouses and a couple of houses over, we had some good friends. And one of the guys did magic tricks. He wasn't like a former, but he knew a lot of magic tricks and was able to do these things. And one thing to know about me, I love watching magic tricks, right? I love watching it because I'm just amazed. And I don't want to know how it happens. I know a lot of people want to figure it out. How did they do that? I just want to be amazed. I think it's so cool when they pull up your car, right? And they can do this trick. And so this guy would come over and uh, I would be like, man, do, do some magic trick. And he'd do something and I'd be amazed, right? But at the end of the day, I knew that it was a trick. It's not really magic, right? At the end of the day, magic, all it really is, is misdirection. He say, look over here at this thing, while over here, behind the scenes, we're doing something else. They they want, with the smoke and the mirrors, they have it all over here to, to guide your attention, to misdirect you, while all the while, they're doing something over here. And I'm afraid... That the enemy has misdirected us from God's power. And just like the magicians in Exodus, they were pulling Pharaoh away. They were misdirecting him, saying, look at us and look at our power. But in reality, they had no power to fix anyone's life. I wouldn't have gone to my friend and said, hey, we're kind of behind on rent this month. Can you make $500 appear in my wallet? (laughs) No. And in the same way, when we go to different things in this life, we are trusting in and hoping for these things. They are just cheap imitations for God, the one true God who can fix our problems. And I'm afraid what we end up trusting in, especially here in the South, in a Christian culture, is we trust in our good works. The enemy has misdirected us, and he says, if you come to church and you're good, then God won't judge you. If you come to church, if you keep your nose clean, if you give money every little bit, if you do the right things, then guess what? It'll solve your problems and you will be good. And he's trying to misdirect you into good works. And really, the only thing that can fix your heart is the blood of Jesus. The only thing that can fix your life that is in shambles where you are turned upside down is for Jesus to come in and change you. No amount of good works can change you, but the enemy loves to misdirect us, to put our trust in these other things. But Pharaoh realized the magicians were just cheap illusions. And for you and I today, we need to realize where the enemy has just got some cheap illusion. And he's taken us away. And we need to learn to go to Jesus, the source, the only one who can fix our brokenness. So God demonstrates his power through the plagues. He demonstrates his power over the world's gods. And third and finally, God demonstrates our need to submit to him. He demonstrates our need to submit to him. We have the third plague. And in the third plague, God tells them, stretch out your staff, strike the dust, and gnats will come. And they will swarm, and all these biting insects will swarm over all of Egypt Look at verse 18. This happens. Verse 18. The magicians tried by their secret arts to produce gnats, but they could not. So there were gnats on man and beast. And then the magician said to Pharaoh, this is the finger of God. Ultimately, three times the magicians had been able to figure this thing out. They had been able to replicate it. They had been able to misdirect. They had been able to say, we can trust in ourselves. But eventually, they get to a place where they say, we submit that God has won. This is his doing and nothing that we can do. There is submission on their part of defeat. In this passage, 
in these plagues, we also see submission of another man. That man is Moses. If you've noticed in this passage, Moses is a little different than what we've been seeing all throughout the book of Exodus. All throughout the book of Exodus, we have been seeing Moses, and what is he doing? He is complaining to God, isn't he? When he calls him in chapter 3, and he says, you are to go and do this, what does Moses say? Well, I can't. I can't speak. I can't do this. I can't do that. He makes all of these excuses. Moses has learned to submit to God. Look at chapter 3. If you would just go back to a couple of chapters. In chapter 3, God calls Moses. I think this is important. God calls Moses and he says, I want you to go to Pharaoh. And look at chapter 3, verse 18. He said, and they will listen to your voice. And you and the elders of Israel shall go to the king of Egypt and say to him, The Lord, the God of the Hebrews, has met with us. Now please let us go three days' journey in the wilderness that we may sacrifice to the Lord our God. This is what God tells Moses to say. Fast forward to Exodus chapter 5, verse 1. Moses goes and look at what it says. Afterwards, Moses and Aaron went... And said to Pharaoh, did you notice right off the bat, they're not obeying? Because who did it say they were supposed to take? The elders of Israel. So right off the bat, Moses says, God, I know, me and Aaron got this. Right off the bat, there's disobedience. And look what he says. Thus says the Lord, the God of Israel, let my people go that they may hold a feast to me in the wilderness. The idea is the same, but they have not spoken exactly what God has said to speak. And what is the result we saw last week? It goes from a bad situation to much, much worse. The people turn on Moses. And Moses cries out. And he says, God, I am at my wit's end. Why would you bring me here? And at the end of chapter 5, Moses is broken, worn down. But perhaps he is changed. Perhaps he is finally willing to submit himself to God fully. To obey him perfectly. Look at Moses now at the beginning of the plagues. Look at chapter 7, verse 6. Moses and Aaron did so. They did just as the Lord commanded them. Look at 7, verse 20. Moses and Aaron did as the Lord commanded. Look at chapter 8, verse 17. And they did so. They obeyed. They found the place where they say, God, you are over all, you are above all, and we are going to submit to you perfectly. And I think I see a lot of Moses in us. We want to fight against God. We want to make excuses. We want to say, I want to do it my way. I'll do what you're asking, but I'll do it my way. But if the plagues tell us anything, they tell us that God is over all things. That he is powerful over all things. God's power knows no bounds. His knowledge has no end. His strength is unmatched. He is king over the earth, over the land, over the sky, over the weather. And if that God is king over all of those things, it must mean he's king over you too. The question is, will you submit to that king this morning? I don't know where you're at in this life. I don't know what's going on in your life. Maybe you've been running from God. Maybe he's been asking you to submit, ask you to follow him, and you say, you know what, I'm just going to put that off. Maybe you think God doesn't see everything going on in your life, that he's not really over everything, and I can just sneak past God. I'll just misdirect God and do something over here the way I want. Maybe say, you know what, at the end of my life, I'll make things right with God, but right now I want to do things my way, and you're walking around, and you've got this grip on your life, and you won't let it go. God is asking you today, submit to Him. John Ortberg, a pastor, shared this one time. He talks about a story, bringing home his baby girl from the hospital, and he said that it was the scariest day of his life. 
when he had to take this little baby, put her in a car seat, and then he had to drive down the freeway with his little girl. He said, I've never been so scared in my life. He said, I was going 35 miles an hour down the freeway because I was so scared with my little girl. He said, the next scariest day in my life was when my little girl turned 16. And I had to give her the keys to the car. He said, then... I wasn't, in the pass I wasn't in the driver's seat. I was in the passenger seat. And he said this, up until then, I had been the one driving. I chose the destination. I chose the route. I chose how fast we were going. But now I had to give it to her. He said, and the hardest thing about it is trusting. Trusting that the person in the driver's seat is going to get you where you want to go. And I think a lot of people like to be in the driver's seat, and they think it's handy to have Jesus sitting in the passenger seat. Jesus, you can sit there in case something comes up, and I'll call on you. But what Jesus is showing us through his power and his might is that he is the one who needs to be driving, and we need to be the one in the passenger seat. The question is, will you allow him to drive your life? It means that you have to give up what you want for your life. You have to give up your choices. You have to give up your ego. You have to give up all of these things that you want for your life and say, God, it's in your hands, and I give it to you. When we read the plagues and we see God's wrath and his judgment, we are tempted to think that God is vengeful, that he's an angry God, that he's just making us do this thing. But if we see Jesus... The mercy of Jesus to take God's wrath and judgment on himself and to offer us forgiveness for our sins, we would realize what a joy it is to give Jesus the keys. What freedom there is to say, Lord, have control over my life and take over and I'll let you drive. Today we have seen God's judgment and his wrath, but also his great mercy in Christ. Would you submit to this king? Let's pray. Father, we come to you with humble hearts, recognizing that we are sinners. Lord, and in our sin, we deserve the wrath of God to be poured out on us. We deserve punishment. God, I pray. I pray that we would submit to you that in submitting to Christ, we would find freedom. That we would find deliverance. Lord, that we wouldn't choose misdirection from the world. But Lord, we would go to the source, Jesus Christ, the one who can fix our brokenness and make us right before God. Father, I pray that you would help us to submit to you today. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. This time we're going to have an invitation. We invite you to stand, to sing. The altar is open. We invite you to come.